Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to my talk today. My name is Sasha Lowen. Uh, I am a PhD candidate at Montana State University. My advisor is Dr. Bruce Maxwell. Uh, and today I'll be talking about on-farm precision experimentation uh, and its applications in organic grain farm systems. So first I'm gonna just quickly uh, introduce OFPE. That's what we call on-farm precision experimentation. Um, what its background is um, and uh, just uh, introduce that. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about how we are applying this methodology in organic grain systems, uh, specifically for some of its major uh, challenges, including nitrogen management and weed management. So uh, just a quick background on precision agriculture. The initial idea of precision agriculture was introduced uh, in the 90s as uh, various technologies started coming, becoming more popular on farms. Uh, and this led to the notion of being able to farm by soil in, uh, in, in farm systems, whereby uh, a farmer could uh, get some sort of soil map of their, of their field or farm, uh, and then adjust their input rates uh, based on those soil uh, attributes across a field. And so here you see we have some soil attribute for a field, uh, and then the farmer can put in some sort of input based on those attributes across the field. This is the initial ideal of uh, precision agriculture. <clears throat> um, this is also complemented by the fact that farmers are uh, natural experimenters. And so within the methodology that we envision, we uh, hope to capture the power of precision agriculture, but also um, enable farmers uh, natural uh, experimentation tendencies uh, to start to learn about their fields in more ways than just the soil types uh, and actually start to experiment uh, systematically. Uh, so here I just have a little picture of uh, a drone image of a field. And uh, you can see all the different layers uh, really clearly on this field where th there were significant weed pressure. And so the farmer actually went in and mowed at one point during the season. Uh, and then the weed pressure continued. So they went in and swathed part of the field. Uh, here you can see tracks from an old road across the field. Here you can see a pile uh, where there's an area where there was an old manure pile in the past uh, that's been burned off now. And so the point here is to show that there are all these differing um, variables that are present across a field and a farmer will begin to understand, you know, what these differing variables look like as the seasons unfold and they start to see um, aspects of this come up next year, uh, but it's done in a very non-systematic way and um, it's, it's a very slow learning process. And we envision using precision experimentation to speed up this process, systematize it, and um, really enable the farmer to learn about their fields uh, quickly uh, through experimentation. So what is on-farm precision experimentation? Uh, basically, how we deploy it uh, with our farmers is we design some sort of prescription map, some sort of experimental layout across the field. Here you can see we have differing um, input levels across the entire field. So we turn the entire field into an experimental unit. We then go through and collect as much data as we possibly can about that field, uh, including satellite data, weather data, the, the uh, data coming off the machines. Uh, and then we, then we model that data and we try to figure out, okay, based on the inputs that we put in on this field and based on the output of the yield, how can we optimize the input such that uh, the farmer sees the greatest net return uh, for their field? And so the next year we put in an experiment, it'll be partially based on that optimized model that we've come up with and partially continued experimentation such that we can continue to learn about the field uh, year in and year out. Uh, and this is designed for continual experimentation. So I just want to show you, uh, with that background out of the way, I just want to show you a few examples of some of the things that we're working on. So we have um, experiments set up across the Northern Great Plains uh, throughout Montana, as well as my own farm back home in Manitoba, where we've been doing some experiments. Um, <clears throat> and I'll start with uh, showing an experiment from here in uh, Northern Central Montana, where uh, this is an 80 acre piece, uh, this primary piece in the center of the photo here. This is uh, this was a, a pea plow down in 2020, and it was followed up with a winter wheat crop in 2021. Uh, and pictured here is the winter wheat. And so in 2020, we varied the seeding rate of the pea and then put in a uniform rate of winter wheat the following season to see how that differing levels of input seeding rate of the pea would affect the following year's crop. And so I'll just highlight that as an example here of our of our OFP methodology. Um, 
So this is kind of all of the variables that go into the model construction. So pictured here is the 80 acre piece uh, with differing variables laid out across it. First, we'll start with these topographic variables. These are um, these are variables that are very important and are going to stay spatially the same year in, year out. So uh, aspect, that is, which, which way is the field facing? Generally, this field slopes away to the north, and so generally it's north-facing field. The slope, again, you see it sort of starts out with a, with a gentle slope, but then actually gets uh, steeper as it moves towards the low area in the north. And elevation, of course, showing that uh, the, the field is higher in the south, moving towards uh, lower areas in the north. All of that goes into the model then. And the important part now is where we uh, vary the seeding rate. So in 2020, P rates were buried across the entire field uh, to conduct this entire field experiment to try to understand how the following crop would respond. And in 2021, then we see the wheat yield there uh, in bushels per acre. You can see in the south it did a little bit better, in the north it did a little bit poorer. Um, but if you look closely, uh, you can actually see in, um, in lines four and five where that heavier seeding rate was put in that the crop actually didn't do quite as well. And so little things like that can start to tell us um, what the optimum seeding rate might be. But when we put, put all of these things into a model, so we take those actual events, then we come up with what an optimum seeding rate would have been in this season uh, for the for that P seeding rate. And you can see that there are high areas, especially where that slope is leading into an area which may have collected more water um, in both in the middle of the field and in the northern parts of the field. And so highlighting some of the variability that might be present across the field and how the farmer can manage that. So the new optimum seeding rate is laid out here uh, in, in spatial optimized uh, fashion. Uh, and the overall, interestingly, the overall seeding rate is actually quite a bit lower than what we put in in 2020, highlighting the fact that we can actually save uh, seed costs by incorporating the new seeding rate. And the simulated yield output from that year, you can see quite a bit more dark green in the new simulated yield map, uh, highlighting the fact that our yield also would go up. And so moving from the experimental rate to the um, simulated optimum rate, we actually go up two bushels per acre, um, showing that we can uh, really offer gains to the farmer, uh, especially once we start to con conduct these experiments uh, over multiple years, uh, we can start to understand the temporal variation in addition to the spatial variation. Okay, now I'll just move quickly into a weed example. Um, <clears throat> so this is a, uh, also an 80 acre piece. Uh, you can see I've included one topographic variable here, the elevation, uh, and then um, the seeding rates. Again, we varied seeding rates across this field. This was not a green manure plow down. Uh, this field had nitrogen from, uh, from animal manure, but the um, cash crop, simply the wheat crop, was varied across the entire field. And then we explored how that um, varied seeding rate interacted with the weed pressure present on the field. So I also collected weed samples from across the field and you see in figure C here where the weed pressure exists uh, more strongly, it's darker green, where it's less strong, it's in lighter green. Uh, and putting this then into a model, so I've, I've highlighted something called a random forest model up here and all the variables that go into the model, we can come up with um, an optimized rate of seeding rate, pictured in D here, uh, with darker being more seed, lighter being less seed, um, optimized for minimized weed pressure. So there's different ways that we can uh, deploy on farm precision experimentation. Earlier I showed you how we can deploy it um, to optimize green manure levels for the following cash crop. Here it's simply cash crop seeding rates to try to minimize weed pressure. Uh, and interestingly, we've been doing this now for a couple of years on this field, and you can see in the following season, now this is a different crop uh, and a different year, but you can start to see some of that temporal variation really come into play where we put in, again, experimental rates across the field. In this case, it's hemp, so different crop, but you can see a, a very different weed presence pressure. And based on that, a very different optimized uh, hemp seeding rate for uh, controlling or attempting to control uh, weeds across this field. So all of this highlights how we can use these, these different methods to really um, counter some of the challenges organic farmers face. 
Um, and then finally, just to bring that back to my, uh, Montana here, where we um, are also tracking perennial weeds across the field. So on this field in particular, we've been measuring um, thistle patches. And you can see 2019, 2020, and 2021, where we have um, tracked the thistle patch across the field and seen how they're growing. Uh, in most cases, they're growing. Uh, and how they are responding to the varied seeding rate. So some of this data has yet to be analyzed, but this is this is some this is a, one of the directions that we're heading with with this project uh, is to tackle weeds, both perennial and annual, uh, and then also nitrogen management. Um, so yeah, just to summarize all of that, so on farm precision experimentation is this new methodology that we're really working um, to help farmers out with in that this method of constant experimentation. Uh, can help a farmer um, speed up their learning of their fields. We know that farmers know a lot about their fields already, but this can really systematize the methodology uh, of the learning uh, and uh, systematize the experimentation that goes into it to help the farmer understand and, and really harness the, this era of big data that we're living in and use all of these different data sources to, to um, optimize whatever input they would like to. And so that can be the cash crop for net returns. It can be the cover crop for nitrogen management or it can be any crop uh, to determine uh, the best weed management strategies based on seeding rate inputs. So all of this collectively really moves the uh, precision ag methodology beyond simply farming by soil and um, allows farmers to start to understand variation uh, in, a, in a deeper level. So just to conclude, we are continuing to work with these farmers um, across uh, these different uh, farms across the Northern Great Plains. Uh, and every year that we develop a new experiment for a specific field, we start to learn more and more about that field and we start, can start to optimize in better and better ways. Um, all of this is working towards a project in which we are um, automating the workflow so that the data actually comes in. Um, automatically, uh, and we're working on uh, open source software applications as well in our lab, such that farmers can, can really begin doing this on their own. Um, so that's all I've got for today. Thank you all for listening. And um, yeah, please um, ask some questions. Thank you.